I love that we get to participate in both sacraments today, uh, sitting there watching many of you come up and remember your baptism. Um, that is a holy, holy moment. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's a sacred space when we come to worship and to remember that Christ has died for us. We witnessed Jacob's baptism, the tangible sign of an unseen grace at work in his life. And later we will partake in the fellowship of the Feast of Communion, where we tangibly remember Christ's body and blood in the bread and the cup. I love this because our worship of God is always embodied. It's a fleshy faith that we have. It isn't simply thinking that we trust God or having loving thoughts about God. We participate in worship with water and bread and cup. We also participate in the tangible expression of trust with our financial gifts, whether in check or cash or digital ones and zeros. Our offerings are a physical expression of trust in the one who is the giver of all good gifts. And we are grateful. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the ways you have equipped us for the mission and ministry of your church. As we give out of what has been given to us, we pray that you would multiply these gifts for your kingdom purposes. As we have journeyed through the origin stories of Genesis, we have seen over and over again that you are working and moving toward redemption. God, there are those of us in this room who cannot see the redemption story you are writing in our lives. We question, we doubt, we feel uncertain, and we wonder, where are you? Remind us, Lord, of your nearness. Remind us that though we feel that the darkness will hide us from you, that the darkness will not be dark to you, the night will shine like the day. Help us to remember that the sacraments of our faith, baptism, and communion are symbols of death, but they are transformed into resurrection life. God, this week our students will return to their classrooms. Some will go to new schools or start school for the very first time. We pray that you would give them new friends that will lift them up when they are low. Bless them with friends that will encourage them and make them laugh. And may be, they be the kind of friend that others need as well. For all our students, we ask that you would remind them of their worth that cares nothing for their grades or their performance. At the core of who they are, may they know your love for them. We ask that you would teach them your ways and light their paths even as they learn math and science, history, and more. Give students a sense of awe in the world that you have made, a world we get to learn about, study, and enjoy. We also ask that you protect them. Protect them from harm, protect them from hurtful words and unkindness. Give each of them trusted adults and mentors to be guides and companions on their journey. We pray also for our teachers, school administrators, aides, and coaches. May their work bless the students they come in contact with. We pray that their work would be a way in which your love flows to students. And would you give them joy as they labor to teach. God, we also lift up parents. The task of parenting is a great joy and a great challenge. For parents that are sending students off to college, we ask that you would remind them that you go with their students. For parents dropping children off at kindergarten for the first time, we ask that you would remind them that their children are your children too. For parents who are weary, we ask that you would bolster their faith and give them rest. King of kings and Lord of lords, you sit upon the throne of the universe, yet you are intimately involved in the workings of the world, including each of our lives. As we come to your word this morning, we ask that you would work in power to help us see you as you truly are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
after the service, if you are heading off to college either this week or very soon and you're going to be leaving us for a time, uh, we invite you to come and gather under the cross. And for those of you who would like to gather and send them off in prayer, uh, please join us for that as well. We're doing something a little different this morning. Usually there's the prayer and then scripture reading, and then I come up to preach, but I'll be reading the scripture reading within the sermon today. So we're just launching right into the sermon. In 2010, the world was still recovering from the Great Recession of 2008 and 9. At the same time, I was recovering from a broken heart. The guy I had been dating broke up with me, and I was devastated. My internship at a church in California came to its end, and my parents were moving out of state. At 27, heartbroken, jobless, and not really wanting to move to South Dakota, I wondered what in the world was I going to do next. I felt like I was in a pit. And it was around this time that I came to love the story of Joseph. Joseph's story is one of highs and lows. He's favored by his father. He's thrown into a pit by his brothers. He's sold as a slave, but rises to an honored position. He's falsely accused of a crime and thrown into prison. And finally, he is raised up as second in command, <clears throat> excuse me, in all of Egypt. This story brought me comfort because it helped remind me that even though life can be low, like life in a pit, God is nevertheless able to bring about goodness for me and for others and for his good purposes. This story has sustaining power for us when we need to remember that God is sovereign. Essentially, that is what this entire series, this entire origin stories of Genesis series is about. The origin stories of God's people point us to a God who is sovereign. Sovereign isn't a term we use a whole lot in our everyday conversation. Sovereign simply means possessing supreme or ultimate power. That's why the king or queen of a country is called the sovereign. They have the ultimate power over that country. For Christians, God's sovereignty is a foundational theological claim. God has supreme or ultimate power over the world and everything in it. In my own story, I can trace God's sovereignty time and time again. Picking up in 2010, I spent some time working in retail while looking for a job in ministry. I realized the guy that broke my heart was actually kind of a jerk, and I was lucky to not end up with him. I ended up in 2010 moving to Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I would work for the Canada Conference of the Covenant Church, and I met my husband, Brian, shortly thereafter. And at some point in 2011, we were reflecting on how it just would have been nicer to meet each other earlier in life. For myself, I said it would have been nice to skip all of that disappointment and heartbreak I experienced from that guy I had been dating, to which Brian replied, yeah, but then I wouldn't look as good. <laughs> God does indeed work all things together for good. Our sermon today is focusing on the events of chapter 40 and 41 of Genesis. I encourage you to read the whole Joseph narrative, chapter 37, I think, all the way through the end of Genesis 50. Uh, you can do it in probably less than half an hour. It's, a, it's an incredible story, and reading it in one full sweep carries the reader through the story the way the author intended, revealing a narrative of God at work, a narrative of a sovereign God working for his redemptive purposes. So let's do a recap of Joseph's story, because we, we skip quite a lot in this series, and it'll bring us to our text today. Joseph goes from favored son to slave in a matter of a few pages. Then he becomes a favored personal attendant to Potiphar, a high-ranking official in Egypt. But things go south for Joseph when he's falsely accused of a horrible crime and unjustly put in prison. 
Yet even in prison, we read in Genesis 39 that the Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph was shown kindness in prison. He rises up again to be trusted by the chief warden, and when Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, or that's a better way to understand it maybe would be Pharaoh's butler, and his chief baker are put in prison, they each have dreams. Dreams that Joseph is able to interpret with God's help. He asks only when, that when things go the way he says they will go in the dreams, to not be forgotten. He asks to be remembered. But the chief butler who survives his ordeal while the baker does not, forgets Joseph. And two years go by before Pharaoh has a pair of dreams and the butler finally remembers Joseph. Joseph gets brought before Pharaoh to hear Pharaoh's dreams. And we read this in Genesis 41, beginning at verse 15. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I'd never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain full and good growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin, scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the ma magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of a great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dreams play a significant role in Joseph's entire story. He dreams that his brothers will one day bow down to him, and the realization of that dream we will discuss in our text for next week. He interprets the dream of the chief butler and baker, and now he's called in to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. The dreams of Genesis are fascinating, but the dreams themselves are not exactly what we are meant to focus on. The dreams of Genesis are not meant to show us that our dreams can have profound meaning that need to be interpreted, even though that might happen. They're not meant to send us down the path of dream study or to even ask, does God still work like this today, even though I believe he does? The dream stories are meant to pull back to remove the curtain to reveal the dream giver. The dreams reveal the dream giver because the dreams inform us that God is at work throughout this story. They're significant dreams, but even more significant is the one who is giving the dreams. They tell us that there is a sovereign God at work despite the way things appear.
It appears as though Joseph's life is one big leap from frying pan to fire over and over again. It appears that the empire of Egypt is controlled by the sovereign Pharaoh, but the narrative shows us that the dream giver has a mysterious plan that he is enacting, that it is the dream giver who is really sovereign. It's easy and normal for us to get caught up in our own stories, our own pits and prisons, but these dream stories remind us that there is a God at work despite the way things appear. So who is this dream giver? The dream giver is a character former. He is one who has been forming Joseph's character throughout this narrative. Joseph is a man who experiences suffering caused by evil, and yet he has godly character. He is one who knows and relies on God. He's also one who is set uh, up in the prison to care for the prisoners. So when he sees one day that the butler and the baker are downcast, he inquires as to why. They say they've had dreams, but no one is around to interpret them. By this, they mean there are no professional dream interpreters, as was common at the time. These interpreters would be called in, told the dream, and then they would go consult their dream commentaries for an interpretation. But Joseph knows the one who is giving the dreams. And he says in Genesis 40, verse 8, do not interpretations belong to God? Joseph acknowledges that the one who can interpret dreams is God alone. And he does the same thing before he come, when he comes before Pharaoh in Genesis 41. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that you hear a dream and you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Dreams were seen as mysterious and carrying meaning. In this story, the dreams not only predict a future, we, the reader, get to know that God is the one acting to form that future. Joseph recognizes this because he has had his character formed by the dream giver. God has been forming Joseph's character throughout this story. Now, many sermons have been preached on having character like Joseph, run from temptation as Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. Credit God with success the way Joseph does. Save up for hard times like Joseph prepared for famine. Forgive like Joseph forgave his brothers. While these are admirable qualities and certainly much of Joseph's moral character is worth emulating, that is not what this story is focused on telling us. This story tells us that God's sovereignty is at work in the formation of Joseph's character. The injustices that Joseph faced serve to form to in him godly character because God has been the one at work in Joseph's life. God is not only the dream giver of this story, he is the character builder of Joseph. When we seek to live moral lives that do all the right things that we read about in scripture, that's all fine and good, but only God can form our character. And he often does this by redeeming suffering. I wonder if perhaps Paul was thinking of Joseph when he wrote in Romans 5, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Joseph faces problems and trials. Incredible evil is done to him. But in these circumstances, he develops endurance. This endurance develops his character, and this character brings hope of salvation, a hope that does not disappoint. Joseph's trust in God to reveal the meaning of the dream leads to salvation. Salvation from famine for Egypt, salvation for Joseph's family, the chosen people of God. The one who is the dream giver of this story knows Joseph and is forming Joseph for the purposes of the dream giver. 
We cannot become good people simply because we decide to be. Moral fortitude, character formation happens not only because we choose it, but because God is a character builder. He uses the character he has built up in Joseph for his sovereign purposes. We could look at Joseph's story and say, you just got to hold on to God when suffering comes. You just need to trust and be faithful like Joseph. But that's putting the cart before the horse. Paul says that trials, suffering come, and just by enduring them, putting one foot in front of the other, God develops our character. Character that has hope, that trusts, that is faithful in dark times. And that comes often through suffering. Joseph can only be seen as a faithful person because God has built that faithfulness into him. God is not only the dream giver, he is also the one who has formed the character of the dream receiver, interpreter, Joseph. Joseph, having been formed by God, is given the opportunity to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And we can trace through this story how God has been at work behind the scenes in Joseph's life. Now, the dreams help us to see that God's sovereignty is also work on a far larger scale. The dream giver, who is the character former, is also the empire upender. Or in positive terms, he is the kingdom builder. The dream giver is the kingdom builder. The dreams are meant to tell us that God is breaking in and doing a new thing. Egypt is a powerful nation. The sovereign Pharaoh has such a disturbing dream that he's willing to listen to anyone who might help him, including a foreigner held in his prison. When the sovereign Pharaoh has his guard down, he's asleep. God breaks in to show him that he is going, that God is going to define the future for Egypt and subsequently Joseph's family, Israel. Pharaoh may think he's in charge, but the dreams show us that the dream giver is really in charge. God is really the one calling the shots. This story ought to strike fear and trembling into the heart of every world leader. While Pharaoh appears to be in charge, the dreams show us that reality is something entirely different. Joseph tells Pharaoh that the, what the dreams mean, that there will be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And Pharaoh cannot control what is coming. The God of all creation knows what is coming and is providing Pharaoh assistance through Joseph. God's future plans, his sovereign will, overturns the conventional power structure because God is not only the dream giver, he's also the kingdom builder. God's kingdom building, his covenant-making promises cannot be thwarted. The dreams reveal to us that God will work as he wills for his purposes, and those sometimes are mysterious to us. We do not understand what is going on when we or others suffer. What we do have is a story, a story that shows regardless of the evil Joseph experienced, God was sovereignly at work bringing about his will to make Abraham and his offspring a blessing to the world. God is so set on this plan that he confirms it by sending the dreams in pairs. The dreams in the Joseph narrative always come in pairs. He has two dreams that his brothers will bow down to him. The butler and baker are a pair of dreams. And then Pharaoh has two dreams about a bountiful harvest followed by famine. And Joseph explains to Pharaoh that his dreams have come in pairs because it is certain to happen. Sovereign God gives dreams to sovereign Pharaoh, which tells us who is really in charge. Pharaoh cannot stop what is coming. It's certain to happen because God has said so. Friends, nothing can stand against God bringing his kingdom to come. It may appear that way. Herod and Pilate thought they had stopped Jesus. But Jesus' kingdom was established anyway. God's kingdom building first through ancient Israel and then through his church is one against which nothing can stand. Not political empire, 
Not media empire, not entertainment empire, not an empire of capitalism, consumerism, socialism, communism, not an empire that can thwart God's sovereignty because sovereignty means power and God is the one who is the powerful king of kings. He does not need to be defended. He does not need a Christian nation. He does not even need a Christian leader. Pharaoh wasn't because God's kingdom has, is, and will be established regardless of any earthly empire. Amen? The dream giver, character former, kingdom builder upends the future of Egypt with a pair of dreams. The superpower of the day can do nothing when the all-powerful God of Joseph reveals his plan. After telling Joseph the interpretation of the dream, Joseph gives Pharaoh a plan to implement in response. God has revealed his plan, what he is doing. He's shown Joseph what is coming, and God is up to something. He has a plan, and Joseph responds to that plan. He, Joseph gets on board with the kingdom building that God is doing. Joseph uses his skills to bless, to plan for this famine. He does not sit by and say, God's doing something. He doesn't need me. He doesn't say, let someone else do it. No. God has a sure, certain, firm, fixed purpose to fully bring in the kingdom of God, and we do not get to sit idly by. We do not get to abdicate our role in kingdom building. Joseph sees God plan, God's plan, and he gets on board. He lays out his proposal for how Pharaoh could respond to what God has revealed. Remember, the covenant promises that God has made with Abraham and his descendants is that they will be made into a nation that will be a blessing to the whole world. In Abraham, the seed of that blessing is planted and it begins to take root in his son Isaac. It finds further branching out in Jacob with his 12 sons. And in Joseph, one of those sons, we begin to see the large-scale work of how God will use his chosen ones to bless the world. He will literally save Egypt as well as Israel's sons from starvation. The dream giver, character former, kingdom builder weaves a redemptive story beginning with Abraham and finding, and finding fulfillment in Jesus Christ and his church. Joseph got to participate in saving the people of Egypt and as well as his own family. In Christ we find salvation for the whole world and we we are called to participate in that saving work of kingdom building. We've got these two sacraments today. These sacraments that testify to the mysterious, redemptive work of God that is unfolding in the world. In baptisms, waters, and communions, bread and cup, we see signs that point to an invisible grace of God's kingdom breaking in and both involve death. In baptism this morning, Jacob was submerged under the water as a symbol of dying to self, dying to sin, dying to his own way. It is a death that identifies us with Christ's death. And thanks be to God, we rise out of the water as a sign that we are united with Christ's resurrection and his kingdom. In communion, we remember that Christ came to establish the kingdom of God, and he does not do it by setting himself up as an earthly king, as an earthly power, but dying on a cross that the whole world might have life in him. The king of kings is sovereign, and he is establishing his kingdom, and nothing can stand against it. Let us pray as we come to the table. Holy God, you are the dream giver, character former, and kingdom builder of this text. You're the one who's at work in ways we cannot begin to imagine even now. You are sovereign over our individual lives. You are sovereign over this church. You are sovereign over our country and all the empires of the world. None, none can stand against your redemptive work. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen.